Okay. So uh, Milton Erickson uh, has a charming thing he says, uh, part of which is that you want to go to a doctor who makes a searching inquiry into an insoluble problem. And I think the matter of men and women constitutes an insoluble problem. <laughs> Uh, for tons of reasons that are uh, ancient and modern. But that being said, we're going to give it a shot, with, uh, partly with the aid of Deborah Ten and uh, not the whole book and not an exegesis of her wonderful work, but just to say again, if you have not read, um, you just don't understand or have read it a long time ago, our, our version is yellow with age. It's, it's a terrific book, and I'm going to refer to it for a couple of reasons. But I wanted to s start out by talking a little bit about a presumption in, in psychological thinking that is uh, at least hundreds of years old in Western culture. And that is the notion that consciousness is a good thing. Uh, consciousness, rationality, self-knowledge goes back a long way in our, our general shared culture and is part of what makes us human, one would say. In psychological matters, the presumption of Freud is predominant. That presumption until, say, the last 50 years or so, uh, expressed uh, in a phrase you're all familiar with, uh, where ego, it was, there shall ego be, which Bruno Bettelheim translates better as, where it was, there shall I be. The notion that you know yourself by becoming conscious and that consciousness takes effort, uh, activity, intrapsychic contemplation, uh, the interpretation of a learned other person, and such. The modern presumption, based largely but not exclusively on Milton Erickson's work, is that unconsciousness is a, an area of great resource, motivation, emotion, and relationship that operates independently of consciousness, with or without consciousness, and alongside consciousness, and in rare instances, instead of consciousness. Freud was very uh, eager to give many examples of the times when the unconscious upsets conscious presumptions, so slips of the tongue and so on. Erickson was interested in instances where unconscious motives and actions advance the goals of the individual in relationship. And I think it's an agreeable notion that although interior contemplation is very good for certain kinds of conscious appreciation, I can come to know myself through thinking about myself or free associating with my analyst and so on. The carryover of this set of assumptions about conscious knowledge of oneself into relationship is a little like trying to drive a modern car on an ancient road. You run into a lot of obstacles. And there we have a kind of insoluble problem in psychotherapy, insofar as I'm familiar with most forms of psychotherapy, in working with couples, the direct notion is first the from the couples that uh, their problems are caused by a lack of adequate communication between men and women, the 
parents and the children, uh, the in-laws and the couple, um, the demands of the work life, which are relational. The boss says, stay late. The family says, well, you're never at dinner. The notion is that clear and honest statement of self-knowledge is the communicational tool that obviates or at least tempers interpersonal troubles between men and women. And it's widely held to be so, so that couples who come to therapy will say, you know, if we could only communicate better, then things would be better between us. And we all share this assumption. If he were only conscious of what he does when he talks to our son, he wouldn't do it, is the presumption. In which regard, I would like to quote my son and grandson to you. Because uh, my son sent me this, <laughs> this um, dialogue he had with my grandson, his son, who's five years old in August. And he's a physical, boyish little boy. And so my son says to him, uh, do you think, this is a quote, do you think you could use your words instead of your body if you don't like something that a friend of yours does? And my grandson says, and this is a quote, Dada, I was like this since I came out of mama's tummy. My son is a school teacher. He's not put off by discussion. He says, yes, but do you think you could change your behavior? Sort of the cognitive behavioral approach. Mateus, my grandson, says, no, you can't. <laughs> well, that's one story <laughs> about the, the great gap of consciousness and the unconscious. Um, the uh, presumption is a kind of presumption in therapy that one must translate what the women say to the men and the men to the women to get some kind of common um, understanding. And that if one can communicate clearly about one's interior emotional states, one will thereby bridge the uh, gap between men and women in understanding, in power and identity relationships in all manner of things. And it's a very charming presumption. And maybe it works. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I want to always keep in mind while we're talking how conversations actually work between intimates because those conversations tend to be much more shorthand, elusive, uh, different in, in kind. Uh, I like to cite the example of, of uh, my friend Jamal, who uh, comes from the Bronx, and I come from Brooklyn, so. <laughs> when he and I talk, we talk with grunts, only <laughs> grunts. He says, hey, I say, huh, and we go on like that. He's very intelligent, I think. I mean, he yeah. can speak whole sentences in our native language, English, and he's written papers, and he's a smart guy. But we have that common language. But it's an expressive language. It's not a self-conscious language. Between parents and children when things are going well, and between men and women when things are going well, the language tends not to be very explanatory or even very discursive. 